everyone, and welcome to the Wednesday morning Bible study of the Shiloh Baptist Church of Plainfield, New Jersey. My name is Charlotte Banks, and I'm the facilitator for this Bible study in the book of Acts. I'm so happy to have you studying with us today. Shiloh uh, is located in, the, in Plainfield, New Jersey. We've been serving that community and the uh, other towns surrounding for 113 years now. So uh, I'm glad that you're joining with us as we expand our ministry here through Bible study. Let's go to the Lord right now and uh, ask for his presence on our Bible study. So join with me in prayer, please. Father God, it's in the name of your precious Son, Jesus, that we come to you, Lord, so very grateful. Just another opportunity, Lord, that you have given us, and we thank you for it. We, Lord, we're studying your word. We're understanding what's going on there uh, in the book of Acts, and especially now with the Apostle Paul in Rome. So we want, we want to understand how to apply these things to our lives, so we're grateful that we have this opportunity, Lord. We ask that the Holy Spirit bring to our remembrance the things that we've learned and prepare our hearts and minds for what is yet to come. In the name of your precious Son, Jesus, amen. All righty, so we are in Acts. We're still in uh, Acts chapter 28, and uh, we finished up. Um, well, I'm going to recap. I'm going to begin again with chap uh, chapter 28, verse 17. We've been in that verse for a while. We've actually gone through it, but I want to start there because it is the, uh, the setting or the framework for where we're going to be uh, really, actually through the, the remainder of the book. So, again, I'm reading from the NIV translation, and I'm going to start Acts chapter 28, verse 17. Three days later, he called together the local Jewish leaders. When they had assembled, Paul said to them, My brothers, although I have done nothing against our people or against the customs of our ancestors, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. So we, we spent um, a good amount of time in this verse because there were so many things that we really needed to look at. Uh, we, wanted, we went back and looked at the uh, prior scriptures starting actually with um, chapter 21 and Paul's arrival in Jerusalem. Because what he said to the Roman Jews was a little different. The order in which he, he was describing things to them was different than what they occurred. And so we wanted to go back and look at what had actually occurred so that we could understand maybe why was it that Paul was giving these Jews in Rome this summary of, of events that was... Um, just different than from what we knew had occurred. And in some cases, he left out what we might consider to be pertinent information. Uh, but I think that we are understanding that with his arrival in Rome and with him in his own um, private residence, so to, uh, so to speak, even though he was still with a soldier, still, uh, in, still considered a prisoner, uh, even with the freedoms that he had of receiving people in, he changed the focus of his missionary journeys. In other words, we might think that Paul is in prison in Rome, but Paul is on another missionary journey. It's just that he is stationary there. And we looked at the what he wanted to do initially at Rome. We looked at his letter to the Romans, especially in chapter 15, of what he was planning to do. And we understand now that, uh, as we have seen throughout, that Paul cannot pass up any opportunity whatsoever to present Christ. It doesn't matter the audience. That's his focus. That's what he's charged to do, and that's what he's going to do. So now that he is in Rome uh, and he's, is, he's restricted, he has to have people come to him. We talked about the fact that the believers probably are not at liberty to come and go uh, in the Roman uh, in Rome at that time, whereas the the Jewish leaders would be able to come visit him. So he starts with them. Uh, he has always actually, as we have looked through his his different missionary journeys, notice that he 
when there was any uh, Jewish presence, whether a synagogue or whatever, he would always begin with the Jews first. He accepted the, his, his assignment as a, the apostle to the Gentiles. He accepted and embraced that. But he never would stop uh, working with Jews. I think he just he couldn't help himself. It was just part of, of who he was and, uh, in a sense, maybe part of what he really wanted to do. Uh, I think that he felt so strongly how he was converted uh, and that other Jews needed to be converted as well. And if he could help in that, he was going to do it. So we found ourselves here and then we were looking at verse 18. So this is Romans 28, verse 18. He says, they examined me and wanted to release me because I was not guilty of any crime deserving death. And we talked ab about that at length, and, you know, explaining that if there, if someone was going to be in prison or, or having, being executed or whatever, only the Romans could do that. So even though the Jews were the ones that had the issue with Paul, they, they in fact wanted to kill him, but they, they did not have um, the ability to do so. And the Romans were the only ones. And, and the trial that we saw first with Felix and then with Festus, there was no basis for it. And so we're going to look a little bit more at that today. Uh, but he makes a statement to these Jews in Rome. You know, so he, he's uh, in, introducing himself to them, so to speak. And he's making these statements, I think, to put them at ease. He wants to talk to them. He actually wants to present the gospel to them. That's what he really wants to get to. But he doesn't know what they have been told. He's not quite sure of, of uh, their position. So he says these things as a means of explanation as to why he's there and why he's there as a prisoner. And also to perhaps allay any concerns that they might have so that he, he will in fact be able to present the gospel to them. So then at verse 19, and we did take 18 and 19 together because they sort of uh, go one with the other. Uh, he says, the Jews objected, so I was compelled to make an appeal to Caesar. I certainly did not intend to bring any charge against my own people. And so this was as far as we had gotten uh, last week. And actually, we had not gotten to the last part of verse 19, which is where I'm going to begin here. So uh, the beginning of verse 19, he says, the Jews objected, so I was compelled to make my appeal to Caesar. And we talked about the fact that he had, uh, the, the order in that was, was not exactly right. He had already made his appeal uh, to Caesar prior to uh, the objection of the Jews as far as the way he's presenting it here. So we talked about uh, the change in order on that one. And then he says, I certainly did not intend to bring any charge against my own people. He's saying this to the, the Jews in Rome. And what what I I take from that is he's there in Rome because he made an appeal to he made an appeal to the emperor, and his appeal, of course, Festus granted it. He had to grant it because Paul is a Roman citizen. So in, in the appeal, uh, and the, the strategy that the person making the appeal could take is, is uh, one of two approaches or maybe even a combination of both. So they're making an appeal because charges have been brought against them. So in Paul's case, so you can refute the charges. So you can take them one at a time and refute them, proving they're not true. But another strategy also would be to perhaps find another reason. Uh, in, in some cases, as we see um, currently, sometimes the defendant is going to find somebody else that could possibly be the perpetrator of the crime. So they're introducing doubt uh, which in, in today's proceedings, that's all that's needed, is, is that there's a reasonable doubt that someone else might have done it. So Paul could have uh, issued counter charges. Uh, like we made note of the fact that in his 
the verses 17 and 18 when he was presenting what had taken place to the Romans he did not make any mention in those verses of what the Ephesian Jews had had done to him the charges that they had made how they had beat him he didn't talk about the plot to kill him uh, he really didn't even talk about the the whole debacle in the Sanhedrin and all the things that went down there so he he did not make any charges against the Jews or in any of those instances and he is saying here in verse 19 to the the Jews at Roman to the Jews at Rome excuse me that he not only did he not make any but he never intended to bring any charge against his own people so you remember you might recall this goes back a little bit but there were um, problems in Rome with with the Jews so under Emperor Claudius um, and we noticed this back when we were when Paul was in Corinth and he had met Aquila and Priscilla because they were among those who had been expelled so Emperor Claudius had expelled the Jews from Rome because there were so many problems uh, with them and they all really surrounded the the misunderstanding of who Jesus Christ was and what the this new sect as they called it or the way the believers what it was that they were doing so there was so much of a problem that Emperor Claudius just expelled them all they all had all the Jews had to leave Rome so after Claudius died uh, Nero did not seem to keep that into effect because they, they came back but it's not been that long that they have been back in Rome so the thought that this person Paul might come to Rome in his appeal to Caesar and somehow uh, implicate or or present charges against other Jews might cause a little bit of unrest and so he wanted to, them to know I'm not here to make any trouble against anybody. In fact, I never wanted to make any claims or charges against any Jews because I am a Jew. That was his whole thing, and you recall, presenting himself as an authentic Jew. So he makes that statement to them there, and I think it really was another way of him trying to, to put them at ease. You know, they might be... Uh, you know he obviously asked for them to come and so they they initially may have wondered why he wanted them may have already started to become defensive I don't know but he wanted he's saying these things to them explaining why he's there in Rome why he's he is there in Rome as a prisoner and why he wants to see them and what has happened from his perspective in case because uh, he doesn't know what they may have heard okay now we get then to uh, to verse 20 and he says for this reason I have asked to see you and talk with you it is because of the hope of Israel that I am bound with this chain all right so here in in verse 20 Paul finally gets around to stating his reason for wanting to see them for, for calling them and what we see here actually in verse 20 is what I am describing as the beginning of his evangelistic efforts there at Rome beginning right there in verse 20 and he he says here that he uses the terminology that it is because of the hope of Israel that I am bound with this chain now that is new terminology for us we have not seen that terminology hope of Israel throughout uh, from the time that he arrived back in Jerusalem back in Acts chapter 21 till now this is the first time this is coming up and actually what what that um, got me to thinking about was why he says that because if you recall that statement uh, which deals with the Messiah we're going to get into that in a minute but it really is not related to why he was in custody 
So you remember that he was in custody initially because of the accusation of the Ephesian Jews. Now I'm going to go back for a, a couple of different scriptures at different places, uh, and you can turn with me if you like. Uh, we um, probably won't be able to display them, but uh, you know I'll just read them, just as a further reminder of what it is that took place. So back in in Acts 21, like back where it all began. In verse 28, this is the beginning. These are the actual accusations that started everything off. So these are the uh, Ephesian Jews that are find fall or see Paul in the temple. He says, so the verse starts uh, shouting. These are the Ephesian Jews that were shouting. Fellow Israelites, and I just have to say, I can't pass this out without saying, they're asking, they're saying, fellow Israelites, help us. There's one man, Paul. I don't even know how many of them there were. What do they need help for? Okay, reining myself back in. Fellow Israelites, help us. This is the man who teaches everyone everywhere against our people. That's the first accusation. And our law. That's the second accusation. And this place, that's the third. So those are the three accusations that they made. And then they add a fourth. And they say, and besides, he has brought Greeks into the temple and defiled this holy place. So those were the four things that started the riot. And it was actually the riot and the quelling of the riot in Jerusalem that caused Paul to be taken into custody. And, and we've been over this, you recall, and it was really more a, a matter of protective custody. The commander came and, and basically rescued Paul from the Ephesian Jews and the mob that were beating him, trying to kill him. So he, he was taken into custody, in a sense, for his own protection. All right, so this is the, the really the beginning of it all. And then when he was trying to explain to the crowd on the steps of the Antonia Fortress uh, is the point in which the steps or the progress towards the trial uh, commenced. So if in chapter 22, which is the very next chapter, uh, Verse 30 is where I'm going to read, because what has taken place, he tried to talk to the crowd on the steps of the Antonia Fortress. He gave a little information about himself, you know, that he was a Jew, he was from Tarsus, and uh, he spoke to them briefly about his conversion, and he got to the point where he, uh, he told them, he shared with them that Jesus had said to him that he would go to the Gentiles, and it was at that point that they just kind of erupted and went crazy, you know, throwing dust in the air and so forth, because they didn't want to hear that. So <clears throat> they got stuck at that point, and so the commander took him back into the prison and was about to scourge him. You recall all this when the commander found out that Paul was a Roman citizen. So throughout all, all of this, the commander then is still confused and, and not understanding why in the world a riot occurred from this little bits and pieces that I can put together. So in verse 30, this is Acts chapter 22, verse 30, the commander wanted to find out exactly why Paul was being accused by the Jews. Those are the accusations I just mentioned. So the next day he released him and ordered the chief priests and all the members of the Sanhedrin to assemble. Then he brought Paul before him, then he brought Paul and had him stand before them. And so the Sanhedrin is the, it was a Jewish inquiry. We really can't call it a, a trial because they, um, they could, they would, re, in their Sanhedrin, they would, could have disputes about local Jewish laws and procedures and so forth, and they would settle them. But they could never uh, uh, have anyone imprisoned or never sentence anyone to death or whatever because that was a capital crime and that was beyond what they could do. Only the Romans could do that. So 
the commander figured he could send him to the Sanhedrin and at least find out what everything was all about. And that, that was not going to happen. So in chapter 23, verse 6, Paul says, Then Paul, knowing that some of them were Sadducees, so, so this was a situation instigated by Paul. Uh, he knew pretty much what was going to happen when he said what he's about to say. All right, so then Paul, knowing that some of them were Sadducees and the others Pharisees, called out in the Sanhedrin, My brothers, I am a Pharisee defended from Pharisees. I stand on trial because of the hope of the resurrection of the dead. All right, so now in chapter 28, verse 20, he says the hope of Israel. Here in chapter 23, this is the first that we're hearing anything of any hope in anything. All right, so in Acts chapter 23, verse 6 in the Sanhedrin, Paul says that I'm on trial because of the hope of the resurrection of the dead. So it was at that point that that was like brand new information. That was nowhere in any of the accusations that the Ephesian Jews made or anything. This was like brand new. But he said that at that point, knowing it was going to divide the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and probably had some idea that it was going to escalate into violence. Uh, he, had been, he, was a, he had been a Pharisee. He was no longer a practicing Pharisee, but he, that was part of his history. And he knew how things work. You know, I mean, it says right there, Luke records of Paul knowing that some were Sadducees. All right, so I think that Paul at that point, when he saw what was happening, because you remember now the high priest had already had him slapped. All kinds of things had already occurred in five short verses till we get down here to verse 6. So Paul basically makes a determination that no good is going to come of him being uh, before any of these Jews. And so I think that he disrupted it on purpose. But the statement that he made was a true statement in the sense that he believed in the hope of the resurrection of the dead. Okay. Now, that statement at that point, though, is actually what caused him to be put on trial with the Romans. Because after this occurred, you remember, they, there was then the, the, the plot to kill him. The commander got wind of the plot and basically had Paul shipped out up to Caesarea and said, Okay, Felix, this is your issue. This is all I know what has gone on. You take it from here. All right, so now in the first trial with Felix, now remember the accusations started it. Then here Paul makes this statement about the hope of the resurrection of the dead, first that we're hearing of that. Then we get to the, the trial, the first trial with Felix, and Paul then repeats some of this. So let's go over and look, if you don't mind, Acts chapter 24 in verse... 20. Acts chapter 24 and verse 20. So this is Paul. He is now presenting his defense. You remember the Jews came in, they had their attorney Tertullus, and they, he made his nebulous accusations. So then Paul says, after he had presented some of his defense, then he says in verse 20, or those who are here should state what crime they found me in when I stood before the Sanhedrin, referring to what we just looked at. Unless it was this one thing I shouted as I stood in their presence, it is concerning the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you today. So here on this trial with Felix, Paul is restating uh, what he said in the Sanhedrin that was causing it all. He's restating this hope of the resurrection. Okay, so that's there. Uh, in the first trial with Felix. In his second trial with Festus, which is really the, the one that is, is, he is go going to cause him to make his appeal to um, Caesar, 
he he makes a statement. This is Acts chapter 25 now. Acts chapter 25. In verse 11, he this he's now making his defense to Festus. And he says, um, if however I am guilty of doing anything deserving death, I do not refuse to die. But if the charges brought against me by these Jews are not true, no one has the right to hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. So what we see here in Acts chapter 25 in the trial with Festus is Paul realizing that Festus was about to send him back to a situation like he had just been in, in the Sanhedrin or actually acknowledging the fact that they were going to lay in ambush and kill him as his nephew had revealed. He knew that that was probably still in play, which in fact it was. Uh, because we saw up a little bit earlier in Acts chapter 25 when Festus went to meet, meet the Jews, it I identified that they really still had that plan in, uh, in play of wanting to kill him. Because that is what they have wanted to do from the beginning. They never really wanted to have him on trial. They never really wanted any inquiry. They absolutely did not want any Roman interference because they knew that that would take him out of their hands. They wanted him in their hands just to kill him. Uh, we've seen throughout his missionary journeys how they would beat him up, leave him for dead. You know, so it's consistent. If nothing else, we can say that they're consistent in that effort. All right. So now, when Paul makes this appeal, uh, that I appeal to Caesar, it ends all of that discussion as it would have to. Uh, he's a Roman citizen, so if he's appealing to Caesar, that particular appeal has to be granted. But I was saying all that to say that in the second trial, he does not make any statement as far as a hope of Israel or a hope of the resurrection or any of that at that point. He simply uh, makes s statements or, or says things that will keep him from being handed back over to the Jews. That's like basically the approach that he's taken here at this point. Uh, whether or not he, he knew what was going to be take place after that, we don't know. But he, he simply knew that no good co could come from him being handed back over to the Jews. Now, he, we get to see a little more information come out when Festus invites King Agrippa into um, the mix. And you, I mean, you recall, this is because Festus knew that he was going to have to uh, send some type of documentation with Paul to for the emperor to look at so he uh, says hey uh, King Agrippa you you being a uh, very knowledgeable of all of this since King Agrippa was in fact a Jew you recall the great-grandson of Herod uh, he enlists his help so when they meet uh, because Ephesus arranges for Agrippa to, to hear him out it's not a trial or anything it's just kind of a hearing and when they meet uh, Paul then says some more things that help us understand where it is that he's making the statement in Acts chapter 28, verse 20. So in, in his meeting with Agrippa, this is Acts chapter 26 now. In his meeting with Agrippa, in verse 6, so this is... Um, Paul basically, Agrippa gave him permission to speak, and so he talks about it. He gives a little bit of, of his heritage of you know when he was a child and all the things that he has done. Uh, in verse 6 he says, And now it is because of my hope in what God has promised our ancestors that I am on trial today. So we have another... Um, permutation, or expansion, or whatever of this. We have different terminology. They are uh, really all the same thing, but if you are just reading them, not understanding that they're related, you know, I, I just wanted to point this out, but, but this is not saying 
here the hope of Israel, but this is closer to it. All right, so verse 6, he says, And now it is because of my hope in what God has promised our ancestors that I am on trial today. This is the promise our 12 tribes are hoping to see fulfilled as they earnestly serve God day and night. King Agrippa, it is because of this hope that these Jews are accusing me. So what Paul does in the statement here to Agrippa is to expand beyond the actual accusations. So he, he probably figures that Festus has told him what the Jews said when they came, the nebulous accusations that they were matter, uh, that they were making. But Paul is basically saying, listen, Agrippa, let me, let me just get to the root of the matter. The problem that the Jews have with me is this. And he breaks it down in this way, knowing Agrippa's background, that Agrippa himself knew all of the history, knew the law, knew the, knew, uh, the promises that were made and so forth. So that these would be words that would ring true to Agrippa's mind. And so in verse 7 when he says, this is the promise our 12 tribes, and in, in that statement there, the 12 tribes, he's identifying all. Uh, for You may recall that there was a split and there were 10 tribes and two tribes split in northern and southern kingdom. But Paul just says, listen, we're all Jews. So the 12 tribes God made the promise to are hoping to see fulfilled as they earnestly serve God day and night. So they're all looking for this. They're all looking forward to this promise of God, which is the hope, which is the Messiah. Okay? So he's working his way into that and saying to Agrippa uh, not to even focus on what the actual accusations were, but this is the root of the matter. All right, now... Some other things come out um, that Paul then, and he goes a little bit more into what he had been doing. You know, he went out and he would go and he'd try to arrest the, the believers and uh, put them in jail and so forth. So he goes and explains all of that on the journey, and he actually talks about his encounter with Christ and what happened there. But when we get down then uh, in verse 19, this is when Paul is expounding a little bit more with Agrippa so this is still Acts chapter 26 at verse 19 he says so then King Agrippa I was not obedient to the vision from heaven he just shared what it had occurred to him uh, the vision that he received verse 20 first to those in Damascus then to those in Jerusalem and in Judea and then to the Gentile I preached that they should repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. That is why some Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. So he, he further explains, sort of saying, you know, this is what I was doing and this is why they seized me and tried to kill me. Verse 22, but God has helped me to this very day. So I stand here and testify to small and great alike I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen. And here we go. Verse 23. That the Messiah would suffer and as the first to rise from the dead would bring the message of light to his own people and to the Gentiles. So Paul pulls on, on King Agrippa's knowledge, King Agrippa's background and says to King Agrippa, I have only ever been dealing with what the prophets have said. The prophets and Moses have said what happened. That's all I have been saying all this time. And what they've been saying is that the Messiah would suffer and as the first to rise from the dead, that's the resurrection there, would bring this message of light to his own people and to the Gentiles. The message of light reflects the hope. So, the statement that he makes in Acts 20 is the first time we hear that particular terminology, but the, the statements, as, as I 
just been outlining leading up to it are what bring us to that point. Okay. So then after Paul has uh, said this, uh, and a few more things happens there. You remember Festus interrupts and you know accuses Paul of being crazy and all that stuff. But down in, this is still Acts chapter 26, down in verse um, 31, we can see the effect that this has made on Agrippa. You know, he has reasoned this thing over in his mind. Of course, he had already asked Paul, you really think you can convert me in a short time? A little bit earlier on. And then Paul says, I don't care, short or long or whatever, I'm looking to convert everybody. But in verse 31, uh, this is Agrippa. He says, after they had left the room, they began saying to one another, Agrippa and Festus, that are these two that uh, are, are the they in this uh, verse, this man is not doing anything that deserves death or imprisonment. Uh, verse 32, Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. So this is the place in which we officially, I guess I can put it that way, see that the Romans were wanted to release him. One of the things that Paul said to the Jews in Rome is that the, the Romans could find no fault and they wanted to release me but I had appealed and, and we know that we see it here and this is in Acts chapter 26 but Paul had already made the appeal so you know that was one of the things that he had presented in a slightly different order okay so King Agrippa had um, had made the agreement well not made the agreement agreed with Festus that there was really no reason that Paul was in prison. He had listened to Paul, he knew what Paul was saying was true, and he knew that it was nothing that would render, him, render Paul worthy of imprisonment or death. It just wasn't. So in, the, in Rome, when Paul is presenting this to the Roman Jews, in verse 20 when he uses the hope of Israel that's what this was related to so I I for my own sake I had to kind of go back and figure it out and say well what what is the hope of Israel you've never said that before but we see how he has said things and again always Paul uh, tailors what he's saying to the audience so as he was going along he said certain things to certain people uh, based on really what what they needed to know, the need to know, and also in terms of what he felt that they would resonate with them. Uh, and here in Rome, he really does want it to be calm and peaceful because he he needs to present the gospel. You know, it, it's like burning in his in his soul. He needs to do it, and this was going to be his audience. These these Jews that were coming in. All right, so now we're going to go back over to Acts 28 and verse, and verse 20. So in Acts chapter 28, verse 20, again, he says, For this reason I have asked to see you and talk with you. It is because of the hope of Israel that I am bound with this chain. So again, this was another, um, a, another point of union another way of him making them understand that he is with them, that he's still an authentic Jew because he's got this hope of Israel as they also have the hope of Israel. And he makes this statement and has at this point then laid out for them how it was that he came to be in Rome, how it was that he came to be in Rome as a prisoner, what had happened that led up to this, the fact that he was not uh, guilty in the first place nor did the Romans feel he was guilty either but that he had to appeal and he knows that the reason he had to do that is because of the hope of Israel is because of the the hope of the the uh, our ancestors the promises of the ancestors is of course because of the Messiah that he has explained 
from the, the Moses and the prophets right down through the Jewish law. He's explained it the way that they understand it, that Jesus is the Messiah, but they were not having any of it. Okay, verse 21. They reply, they, that's the Jews in Rome, they reply, we have not received any letters from Ju Judea concerning you, and none of our people who have come from there has reported or said anything bad about you. Here we go. This is, I guess we could say, technically true. Um, it may, in fact, be that um, the... Well, all right, let me back it up. We know that the, the Jews in Jerusalem and Judea era wanted to kill Paul. That's all that they wanted. So it does not serve their purpose, really, to uh, write a letter, say, to the Jews in Rome. They don't want anybody else involved. They don't want the Romans involved, definitely. Uh, they didn't really want Paul to be in Caesarea. They wanted him back in Jerusalem. So it does not serve their purpose to write to the, Rome, the, the uh, Jews in Rome. They might feel, well, good riddance, we, we, you're, we're rid of Paul, you've got him now. But they would not want to, uh, let's say, officially try to explain what they had done that caused him to have to make an appeal. It just, it, it's probably true that the Jews in Rome did not receive any letters. Um, the, the Jews from Jerusalem had, if you want to look at it, had basically lost twice. They lost first in the sense that Felix did not make a decision. So his not deciding, in a sense, was a loss for them. And they certainly lost a second time with Festus because not only did Festus agree that Paul was innocent, but then Paul had already made the appeal, so he was going to be sent to Rome. And I, there's no doubt in my mind that the Jews in Jerusalem heard of Festus's and Agrippa's decision, or even just whether it was a discussion or not. But they would know that the those Romans, Festus and the, the all of those in the governor's area, those who had the capability of sending Paul up to his appeal, who were going to displace him or or send some information, I should say, with Paul, they had already decided Paul was innocent. So the, it's unlikely that the Jews in Jerusalem or the Sanhedrin or whatever would have, in fact, sent a letter ahead. So we can say that that's probably true, what they're saying here in Rome, that they've not received any letters concerning him. Then they say something else, um, I, which I find kind of interesting in the wording. None of our people who have come from there has reported or said anything bad about you. So this says that they may have, have had other leaders of, of their group who had, say, traveled to Jerusalem. And when they came back, they did not say anything about what had occurred or um, or nothing bad, as, as they point, as Luke records here in the scripture. But this one we have to really wonder about, because it has been quite a bit of time. We know that the very first trial with Felix, Paul was in hell there for two years before Festus even came on. Uh, and it's not clear how long it was after Festus said that uh, he was going to grant the appeal. We don't know how long it took for everything to be arranged for Paul to be transported up to Rome. So the, the, the idea that no word had come, whether it only be, say, um, a rumor flying, eh, a little suspect. But at any rate, once he arrived in Putoli, you know, once that ship arrived and, and they were then on foot on their way up to, to Rome, just like the word uh, traveled up to the believers and the believers came out to meet him, you know that the word had to travel up to the Jews that he was there because Paul, everybody knew about Paul. 
he was he was like uh, one of the main apostles and certainly the apostle that had traveled in more of their area whether it be in the Gentile territory or now here in Rome uh, than anyone else so it's a little hard to believe that they're speaking the whole truth but anyway that's what they said here then verse 22 but we want to hear what your views are and listen to this for we know that people everywhere are talking against this sect so they kind of show their hand here in this they say one thing in verse 21 we've not received any letters from Judea concerning you and none of our people who have come from there has reported or said anything bad about you Paul no we don't know anything what you're telling us is the first we're hearing about any of this stuff then we get to verse 22 but we want to hear what your views are so what does that say right there that says that somebody else has a view and they probably already heard what the other views are we want to hear what your views are for we know that people everywhere are talking against this set. All right. So that posed a question in my mind. I had to go back and reread what Paul said. Because Paul never said anything about the sect. He never said anything about believers. Let, let's just look at that again. Starting here, verse 17. In the middle. My brothers, although I have done nothing against our people or against the customs of our ancestors I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans verse 18 they examined me and wanted to release me because I was not guilty of any crime deserving death verse 19 the Jews objected so I was compelled to make an appeal to Caesar Caesar I certainly did not intend to bring any charge against my own people verse 20 for this reason I have asked to see you and talk with you it is because of the hope that Israel that I am bound with this chain nowhere in any of that does Paul say anything about believers or as the Romans are calling it the sect the way nowhere he doesn't bring it up he says nothing but in verse 22 the Romans say we know that people everywhere are talking against this sect so they clearly have um, information I don't want to call it an agenda although it may very well be an agenda but they they clearly are predisposed to something they're predisposed to wanting to talk to him about these believers where that is not anything that Paul has said uh, so they want to hear what he has to say or so they say they want to hear what he has to say but remember he he asked for them to come so he kind of um, set up the meeting as summoned them or asked for them to come they're there so they probably are curious as to why it is that he asked for them to come and it's like oh and by the way we've been hearing all this stuff about these believers these believers who uh, for those who have been in Rome before they were expelled know were they were somehow involved in causing them to be expelled although actually they caused themselves to be expelled but it was because of um, the believers and what the believers were sharing as far as who Jesus Christ was so in verse 22 we see uh, I, I guess I should call it maybe we see this little interesting um, they insert this little piece of information which is going to play a part uh, we'll see that coming up uh, in, in just a, a next couple verses it's going to play a part in their receptivity or I should say maybe in some cases lack thereof of that okay so we then at this point 
in verse 23, and I'm actually I'm actually going to stop here and not go into it. But in in verse 23, we uh, it, he says they arranged to meet Paul on a certain day and came in even larger numbers to the place where he was saying. So it's like this very first meeting that Paul called for. This much was discussed. Uh, we don't know how long it took. It probably took a, a little while because there may have been, in Paul making his, his presentation, he may have taken his time. You know, Luke records sort of an outline. It appears to be, on the surface, maybe everything that was said, but I'm sure there was more. And then they, they make this, and probably there was some decision made uh, somewhere in there between 22 and 23 that what they want to hear as far as his views could not be presented in that amount of time. Or, now that they know he's willing to share some of his views, uh, they need to be sure that they have the time allotted to do it, uh, and maybe there are some other people that they feel need to be there when they hear this. And in the case of Paul, when he, he told them that, in verse 20, that, that this was the reason he had asked to see them and talk with them, we know that Paul can go into detail, and with the Jewish audience, he has basically given them some information to try to, I think, maybe soften them up, or to try to make sure that, or, or hopefully, that they were not predisposed one way or the other, to feel them out, to get a determination of what have they heard? Did anything get sent here? Uh, what's going on? To, to feel that and I think he got his answer to that that while maybe nothing officially was sent there may not have been any letters but there certainly has been some talk so we're going to pick up there uh, next week with Acts chapter 28 verse 23 and we're going to look at this second meeting of uh, how Paul handles it what takes place in that all right, so that'll be next week, Acts chapter 28, verse 23. So, thank you again for, uh, for joining with us in our Bible study today. Um, it's, it's just exciting. It's kind of winding down. It's still taking little twists and turns, but we are, are grateful for what we're learning uh, throughout all of this. So we, we do live stream this Bible study here on Wednesdays at 11 o'clock. But again, as I've said before, you can watch it at any point in time uh, on the Shiloh website, you sim shilohplainfield.org. You simply go to the Wednesday Bible study page and you can see all of our sermons or wherever you may watch your, um, the video, whether it's on Facebook or wherever. So we encourage you to join us on the live stream. We also live stream our worship services on Sunday mornings uh, at 9 a.m. This past Sunday we did have some technical difficulties, but the uh, service is available for you to view, so I encourage you to do that. We also invite you to join us for in-person worship. Uh, it's nothing like being there, so we invite you to join us in person. On our website, shilohplainfield.org, there is a registration button. You just press that and, and complete the registration form um, because we do still like to try to track who's there. But now, we invite you to come, if you come this Sunday, which we certainly invite you to do, uh, this is a uh, the first of, of what's going to be an ongoing series of what we're calling the Third Sundays and that would be Sunday ending with a Z on the end, which is reaching out to Generation Z. I am not up on all this terminology, so forgive me if I don't get it straight, but to young people. So there's going to be a, a new focus in our worship service, a new segment uh, that's going to deal uh, specifically with the young people. And what we're asking uh, is that everybody dress down. So if you come, have your sneakers on. You know, wear your jeans, um, wear a, if, if you want a, a message t-shirt like that's, you know, faith in Christ or something appropriate for uh, worship, and uh, come and join us in person for that, okay? Alrighty, now, uh, just a couple announcements. 
I want to just remind you, I said it last week also, but October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And so for all of, all of the ladies out there, again, I say get your mammograms. It is just so critically important. Um, they, it could save your life. So we just want to encourage you to do that. And for all of the cancer survivors, we just praise God for every single year that we are still here. We're grateful. I am a cancer survivor. Uh, and then for all of you who are the supporters, we just thank you. Uh, continue to support uh, the breast cancer. Actually, continue to support all uh, cancer. Uh, it shows no favorites, and it is just um, indiscriminate and ugly. And it, that being said, it is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and so we wanted to make you aware of that. Also, yesterday was the deadline to register to vote in New Jersey, so hopefully you made it in. Now the thing is, vote. If you uh, received, if you applied for and received an, a, um, a mail-in ballot, complete it, and you can mail it in through the mail. You can use any of the approved uh, voter drop boxes. They're, they're listed on uh, the website, New Jersey, uh, gov website. All of them, I know there's one right here local in Piscataway, uh, you, they, you can track your ballot, you know, so it's really safe and important that you do it, do your civic duty. Um, even though there's, this is not a national election, I know in New Jersey we're voting for governor, so there's a lot. And your local elections really are the ones that affect your lives even more. You might not think about them much. Okay, we want to pray for our pastor. Pastor, the Reverend Dr. Daniel L. Brown, and for the Shiloh leadership. We want to pray for all of the sick and shut in, for not just our members, but people sick and shut in everywhere. The COVID-19 is still real, whether it's, it's one of the variants or whatever, it has not gone away. So we ask that you do your part in being safe, get vaccinated. And once you're vaccinated, get your, uh, your proof of vaccination on the Docket app, which you can download to your phone so that you always have your proof and you don't have to carry your vaccination cards around. There is um, a link to that on our website, the Proof of COVID-19 Vaccination. So we want to keep in our prayers all of those who, who deal with that, whether it's a first responder, hospital workers, uh, whether it's a government agency, you know, the FDA, the CDC, we want to keep all of them in our prayers. Because we, we really have got to beat this thing. So we just ask that you commit that to your prayers as well. So again, thank you for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you on Sunday, hopefully live. Uh, if not, watch our live stream. And, and if, in fact, um, there is ever, we, we're not claiming it, we're hoping not to have any problems. But if there is ever an issue, you will be able to view it later. So we encourage you to do that. So let's just go to the Lord in prayer right now as we close out our Bible study. Father God, in the name of your precious Son, Jesus, we thank you for this time that we've had. We thank you for our, our, uh, the ability that, that you have given us through your word, that we can reflect on it, that we can review, that we can double check, as it were, so that we can have an understanding of what's happening based on what has happened before. So we thank you, Lord, that we've had that opportunity to do this review and that we can see uh, Paul going forward. He's just on a missionary journey. It just happens to be there in Rome, and he is starting out with the Jews. So we look forward to what you're going to, to show us through that, Lord, how we apply it to our lives. We ask that the Holy Spirit be with us as we go through the week and present us back again next week as we study your word again. And we ask this again in, in the name of your precious Son, Jesus. Amen. <music>